My name is Seth Augenstein. I'm the Senior Science Writer for Forensic Magazine. Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Kyogen. Today's presentation is called Using Methylation Patterns to Determine Origin of Biological Material and Age. Florida International University, FIU, has been investigating the potential of epigenetic methylation as a procedure for the identification of body fluids and estimating age from DNA left at crime scenes. There are a number of advantages to using epigenetics in body fluid identification, including a downstream analysis performed using DNA, standard DNA extracts, which is therefore easily integrated into existing laboratory workflows. Because epigenetic methylation involves covalent bonding, the method is very stable, permitting analysis of samples over 20 years of age. The procedure is also human-specific and resistant to inhibition. In this study, we have identified a number of tissue-specific epigenetic markers, including those that are specific for blood, sperm, saliva, and vaginal epithelia. In today's webinar, our speakers will discuss, first, the development of epigenetic loci for body fluid and age determination. Second, the work in the analysis of methyl array data, pyrosequencing, real-time PCR, and the initial validation of these procedures. And third, the possible future integration of these markers into the forensic lab due to the simplicity of the analysis and the ease of application. We have recruited top experts in this field to help us navigate today's discussion. While you are listening to the presentation today, I encourage anyone in the audience to submit questions at any time by typing into the designated comments section on your screen. Following the presentation, we will have a question and answer segment where today's speakers will answer individual questions submitted by the audience. Remember that today's webinar will also be available on demand, so you can view it again at your convenience or share it with friends and colleagues. You will receive an email with a link to access the webinar within the next few days. Now I would like to welcome today's speakers. First is Bruce R. McCord. He is a professor of analytical and forensic chemistry at FIU. Dr. McCord received a B.S. in chemistry with honors from the College of William and Mary in 1981 and a Ph.D. in analytical chemistry from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1986. His research interests involve forensic genetics, toxicology, and explosives residue detection. He has published over 100 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters, and his research has been supported by the National Institute of Justice, the National Science Foundation, TSWG, the Department of Homeland Security, and various industrial concerns. He serves as deputy editor for the journal Electrophoresis and is a member of the editorial boards of the Journal of Forensic Sciences and the Journal of Forensic Chemistry. He also is a member of the scientific advisory board of the Green Mountain DNA Conference and the Biological Methods Subcommittee of the OSAC. In 2008, he was awarded the Paul Kirk Award of the Criminalistics Section of the AAFS. Peter St. Andre is currently a criminalist, too, at the San Francisco Police Department Crime Laboratory. He has been at his current post for almost two years. He received his B.S. in genetics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2009 and his master's in forensic science from the George Washington University in 2014. Before his employment with SFPD Crime Lab, Peter had worked as a DNA analyst at Bodie Selmark Forensics for three years. Amy S. Lee graduated from Cornell University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Biological Sciences and from George Washington University with a Master of Forensic Science degree. Ms. Lee was previously a forensic serologist with the Serological Research Institute for nine years, also serving as their technical leader. Ms. Lee has worked as a criminalist, too, with the SFPD as well since 2016 and is experienced in biological screening methods and DNA analysis. Dr. Ruth Claver studied biology and molecular biomedicine at the universities of Marburg, Munster, and Salamanca. 
She performed her PhD studies at the Center of Reproductive Medicine and Andrology in Munster as a member of the graduate school Cell Dynamics and Disease and the International Max Planck Research School. Her research focused on epigenetics in male germ cells, and after finishing her PhD in December 2013, she continued her research projects on a postdoctoral position. In August 2014, Dr. Ruth Claver joined the Product Development Department of Kyogen. She was heading sub-projects in the development of the Pyromark Q48 Autoprep. In addition, she is supporting life cycle management of the Pyromark product portfolio. Since December 2015, she is working in the field of single cell analysis and supports life cycle management of single cell product portfolio, Kaya Scout and Replogy. She was responsible for the development of the Kaya Scout instrument and the Replogy Advanced DNA Single Cell Kit. I will now turn it over to our first speaker, Bruce McCord. Enjoy the webinar, everyone. Here we go. Good morning. I'm Bruce McCord, Professor of Analytical and Forensic Chemistry at Florida International University, and today I'm happy to give you an overview of epigenetics and forensics and discuss some aspects of our current research efforts. I'm especially grateful to the National Institute of Justice for funding this work and to Kaijin and Forensic Mag Magazine for setting up this webinar. I'm also extremely grateful to Amy and Peter at the San Francisco Police Department for their expertise and assistance in moving this method forward. I first became interested in the potential for epigenetics following some casework I performed as an expert witness. In this particular case, DNA from blood under a woman's fingernails implicated her husband in a crime. In his defense, he claimed the DNA found was not blood, but simple DNA passed from his child to his wife, an innocent secondary transfer. The critical question was not the presence of the DNA, but if it was blood, from her last act scratching his face before she died, or simple innocent transfer from the mother to the child to the father. Unfortunately for this particular case, there was insufficient material for positive confirmation of the blood. Um, the problem is that current procedures for body fluid identification date from the 40s. They're chemical and enzymatic tests. And they lack specificity and sensitivity when you compare them to the PCR. Um, PCR tests basically can detect nanogram levels of DNA, and another issue um, is the problem of sample and rape kit bat logs. Many labs are now going straight to DNA testing and do minimal serological work, or they use real time instead. A more sensitive test is needed for body fluid identification that's compatible with STR testing. So if we take a look at the uh, the um, figure here, you can see that um, the forensic analysis, when they're trying to look at body fluid determination, are looking at the whole process of transcription, um, from the proteome to the transcriptome down to the genome, and for us, the epigenome. And the idea is that um, if we take a look at the base of the tree, we have to some advantages, because we don't have to worry so much about gene expression and other issues. Um, we can get to the control of the process of, of transcription and use this information to specifically target um, cells by how they, how they work. And so if we take a look at epigenetics, it, it should be obvious to anyone that um, your human body has different types of cells, skin, hair, teeth, and yet, yet all of our DNA is the same. And Everyone in forensic science has always known that uh, identical twins don't share the same fingerprints. And even more interestingly, studies of twins show that their whole genome methylation patterns become even more different over time, as does their appearance. And you can see this as an example, these two women who are identical twins, or the epigenetic methylation that's shown in the, the picture to the left. So the question is why, and the answer is gene expression much of which is controlled by epigenetic mechanisms. If we unravel a DNA molecule, we begin to see that there are markers outside of the DNA sequence, such as methylation of cytosines and histone modifications, which affect gene expression. The best example of this, of course, is the transformation of the butterfly from caterpillar uh, to, the, to the flying insect. Um, and this is a most radical example, I guess, of how epigenetic signals can control gene expression. 
Epigenetic involves the study of heritable changes which cause these effects. Of the varying factors which affect gene expression, DNA methylation is perhaps the easiest to study. Here, methyl residues are covalently bound to the 5' carbon of cytosines through the action of enzymes known as methyltransferases. Interestingly, methyltransferases generally occur, I'm sorry, interestingly, methyl cytosines generally occur in groups known as CPG islands. These are areas of high CPG density that are typically located upstream of genes. The effect of methylation is the silencing of gene transcription, and there are a variety of signaling mechanisms which affect uh, the addition and removal of methylation from these sites. Some of these are very stable, such as those that are involved with cellular function, while others are more transient. There are a wide variety of methods which can be used to detect CPG sites, and you can see them here in this, this figure where they're having either active gene transcription or gene silencing. Some of these uh, methods to detect this are very general and others are more specific. People performing exploratory research in methylation patterns use whole genome chip arrays detecting hundreds of thousands or even millions of CPG sites scattered throughout the genome. They test various locations for differential methylation. We can then use this data to design primer sites, as you see here, which target uh, tissue-specific methylation sites. We locate primers and design them which access known CPG sites and then test them. And we look around these sites for various areas where we have CPG islands. If we can locate these sites, then we can use their relative levels of methylation for forensic testing. More common applications involve the detection of cancer and other genetic diseases. When we first began looking at this project, we were very interested in some of the work of Eckhart et al. in 2006. This group examined different methylation differences um, between tissues for use in medical diagnostics. This slide shows a heat map which demonstrates, for example, the differences in methylation levels between various tissues. Clearly, sperm is very different. You can see it, it's, it's a lighter color than other tissues which are much darker. Also, you can see in this data that there are keratinocytes which would relate to skin and um, other cell types, lymphocytes which might relate to blood. So this provides hope for us that we could develop a forensic application by looking specifically at cellular types and body fluids that might be specific for forensic diagnostics. So the question is, how do we exploit this forensically? And the, and the answer is, we find locations near genes that target the expression of cellular proteins, or we look at whole genome array studies and compare different tissue types. Then we look in the genome, once we find these sites, we focus and, and dial down in to tissue-specific sites by designing primers around the located sites uh, that were examined in the first step. And then we measure differences in methylation that are going to be more dependent on cell type. The only problem with this is how do you detect the methylation? And there are a variety of ways. Um, the real problem is that PCR doesn't copy methylation. So as soon as you do the PCR process, methylation information is lost. So the way you try to detect the methylation can be done with antibodies or methylases, but the easiest way to do this is to use bisulfide-modified PCR. This locks the differences in methylation in place by converting unmethylated cytosines to uracils, and then through the PCR, those are converted to thymine. For 5-methyl cytosine, these particular uh, molecules are, are sterically hindered and the bisulfite modification does not take place. So you end up with two different types of, um, you can even call them SNPs, uh, AT base pairs and GC base pairs, related to whether or not methylation occurred. This is shown more clearly in the next slide. Here we see the result following bisulfite modified PCR for two different alleles. One of them contains a methylated cytosine, and the other one does not. The method, all of the cytosines which are unmethylated are converted to uracils, as you see, and then in the process of PCR, can convert it to the thymine. However, if the methylation is there, there's no conversion, and you, you basically are you looking at the difference between these GC and, and AT base pair sites. So our objective, then, is once we can locate areas where tissue-specific gene expression occurs, We'll design primers to encompass the CPG islands and determine if they are truly diagnostic sites. We can use pyrosequencing and, in some cases, real-time PCR with high-resolution melting to detect the methylation differences and then begin to differentiate biofluids found at the different crime scenes.
And we sp began by specifically looking for blood, saliva, sperm, and vaginal epithelial cells. Okay, so at this point I'm going to pass it over to Ruth. Thank you, Bruce. Um, on the next slide, I would like to explain to you how the pyrosequencing works and how this method can be used for DNA methylation analysis. And um, the um, pyrosequencing is based on the sequencing by synthesis um, method or principle. And this means that the DNA is sequenced during a stepwise synthesis um, by addition of nucleotides. And the sequencing starts with the PCR product, which has one PCR primer biotinylated. And this biotinylated primer is used during template preparation to um, separate the two um, strands of the DNA and to get one single strand DNA product, um, PCR product. And then you use the sequencing primer to start the sequencing and um, one nucleotide is added after the other. During the uh, pyrosequencing reaction, there are four enzymes present in the system. And these four enzymes are DNA polymerase, ATP sulfurylase, luciferase, and apurase. And uh, these four enzymes allow an enzyme um, cascade um, that generates a light signal when a nucleotide is incorporated. And uh, the cascade is shown here on the picture. So after the incorporation of a nucleotide, a pyrophosphate um, is generated. And this pyrophosphate can be used by the sulfurylase to uh, generate ATP out of this pyrophosphate and the um, APS. And then this ATP is used by the luciferase to um, yeah, change luciferine to oxyluciferine, and this creates a light signal. And this means that if you um, incorporate one nucle nucleotide, you will get one light signal. And um, the um, amount of light that um, is generated is um, yeah, connected to the amount of nucleotides that are incorporated. That means if you have two nucleotides incorporated, the light signal is double as high as the um, incorporation of only one nucleotide. Um, for the sequencing, it's important that only one nucleotide is added at a time. And um, this makes it possible that you um, can read the pyrogram or the peaks, and uh, you can read the, the sequence based on these um, peaks. That is, as it is shown here on the um, right side, where you have a G, a C, an A, then a double G, a double T C, and one T. Pyrosequencing can be used for different applications. You can use it for um, the sequencing through unknown regions, where you can um, afterwards have a look on the peak heights and um, yeah, read the sequence based on the um, peak heights. Then you can use it for um, single nucleotide polymorphism, and here you have to um, tell the software, okay, this is my sequence, and I'm expecting a SNP at this position. Um, this position is yeah, highlighted in blue. And um, then you can calculate, okay, how many uh, templates have phenotype 1 or phenotype 2. You can also use it for uh, mutation analysis. So there you can um, either analyze um, dietary or tetraallelic mutations, or you can also analyze insertion and deletions. And as fourth application, uh, the analysis of DNA methylation is possible. And um, although you only analyze around 150 base pairs in one pyrosequencing run, you can reach plenty of CPG sites, um, because in a CPG island, the CPG sites are often um, yeah, tightly packed, and you will yeah, um, analyze like 20, 30 CPGs within this um, pyrosequencing run. Um, let's have a look on the DNA methylation analysis in detail. As Bruce already explained in his part, um, the bisulfite conversion of DNA helps to analyze the DNA methylation of DNA because um, yeah, um, after a PCR, the methylation is not there anymore. And um, yeah, here's an example. Um, how the bisulfite conversion looks like. So we have one um, sequence, and we have some templates with, the, um, with an unmethylated cytosine, which is um, written here in red, and we have some templates with a methylated CP, um, cytosine, which is shown here in green. And after the bisulfite conversion, the templates with the unmethylated cytosine will have a thymine, and the templates with the methylated cytosine will still have a cytosine at this position. And um, 
when you then perform pyrosequencing, you will get um, a T-peak for all templates which have an unmethylated cytosine, and you will get a C-peak for all templates which have a methylated cytosine. And then you can calculate based on the ratio between the T and the C-peak um, how many templates are methylated. So what is the level of DNA methylation in this sample? A helpful feature of the DNA methylation analysis um, with pyrosequencing is the um, built-in control uh, for the for successful bisulfate conversion. And um, yeah, so um, this built-in control um, has a look on cytosines which are not in a CPG site. So on this example here, it's written in blue. This is a cytosine which is not followed by a G and therefore it cannot be methylated and it should be um, yeah, change to a T after the bisulfeed conversion. And um, when you have this built-in quality control, um, you offer a C or you incorporate a C, and you can see if a C is incorporated. So here you see on the example that um, if you offer a C, there is no peak because all the cytosines um, yeah, have been um, converted during the bisulfeed treatment. Um, and therefore you only have T. But based on this ratio of the C and the T, you can calculate if your bisulfate conversion was successful. Um, here's an overview about the entire workflow, um, which you can use to analyze the DNA methylation um, of some uh, forensic samples. So you start with a sample collection and stabilization, then you um, yeah, will isolate your DNA, um, as you are interested in DNA methylation, you have to um, perform a bisulfate conversion, and then you start with the pyrosequencing workflow. And this workflow consists of um, assay design, preamplification, and pyrosequencing. Um, I will go into this in more detail on the next slide. So, um, in the beginning of a pyrosequencing workflow, you have to um, yeah, perform an assay design. This is very easy, and um, we have a software for this. It only takes around five minutes. Um, after the designing of the assay, you will um, start your PCR, which takes around two hours, and then you can start the sequencing. And um, in the older systems um, we offer, so the Q96 and Q24 or Q24 Advanced, you have to perform a manual template preparation. Um, so this means that you have to um, use a vacuum prep workstation to um, become a single strand um, PCR product out of the double strand PCR product. And um, with our newest product, the Q48 Auto Prep, you have an automatic template preparation. So on this picture here, you see that um, all manual steps are shown as a white circle, whereas the automated steps are shown as a blue circle. And if you compare um, the, the Pyromar Q24 with the Pyromar Q48, you see that the newest instrument from us um, has a lot of automatic steps and the hands-on time is um, dramatically reduced. Um, this picture um, shall show you how the Q48 um, looks like. And um, yeah, you see that we have um, three cartridges with four injectors each. These cartridges um, are used for the dispensations of the enzymes, substrates, and also the nucleotides. And then we have a um, disk which contains 48 wells, and in these wells you can um, load your samples. So in the beginning you just have to um, yeah, load your run with a USB stick, and then you have to load the um, cartridges, and then yeah, you start the run and the instrument will perform the template preparation and the sequencing automatically. And this is an example how um, um, the results from a DNA methylation analysis looks like. So um, we have two samples here. Um, we have an unmethylated sample and we have a sample around 50% methylation. And um, you see that all the CPG sites are highlighted in blue. And um, there is also a number written above this blue um, region which calculates the um, DNA methylation. And um, the DNA methylation is calculated by the ratio between the T and the C peak. And then you see that we also have a histogram um, at the bottom. So um, the histogram always shows you what you ex or what kind of peaks you expect. So um, with the histogram, you can easily um, 
yeah, realize if you um, if your peak pattern is correct or if something went wrong here. So um, with this, I will hand over to Bruce, who will talk about the DNA methylation marker for tissue ID. Okay. Um, so at this point, I would kind of talk a little bit about the methyl methodology. Most people in a forensic lab are familiar with the steps up through DNA extraction and, and on to SDR analysis. And the question is, is where does the... Um, the pyrosequencing-based or, or body fluid analysis-based um, system fit into that workflow? And the answer is it's very easy. You can take a small amount of the sample once it's extracted, uh, remove this, and treat it with bisulfite uh, to, to permit epigenetic body fluid testing. Thus, body fluid testing and STR analysis can be performed easily on the same sample, uh, helping the workflow. And I think Amy and Peter are going to discuss this in more detail. Um, the next slide talks a little bit about how we went uh, initially to select the loci. As I mentioned, there were a number of whole genome studies and other studies by Eckhart which we could, uh, we could look at and uh, try to access. And so to give an example, I can show the work of Tanya Mahdi. She selected and tested a locus known as DC3H, which was found to be hypomethylated in sperm cells. It's interesting that this particular locus is also related to zinc finger proteins and spermogenesis. So it follows with what we might expect. Um, if we take a look at the pyrosequencing for this, you can examine the difference between blood and semen and see it's very clear, and, and it actually we found later um, that it's sperm specific, that the, um, the procedure shows um, the methylated 95% in blood and, and basically completely unmethylated in semen. So we then put together a whole set of uh, results for, all, for a set of four different uh, loci. This slide shows the testing of blood and semen. Um, I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, blood, <laughs> semen, saliva, and vaginal epithelia. The results show that uh, we can discriminate all these different cells, and if you look carefully, you can see that in the case of blood, it's highly methylated, and saliva as well, while for this, the marker for semen, which I already showed, it's unmethylated. And finally, uh, the vaginal epithelial marker, the first one we found, is intermediate in terms of its methylation. And it also shows that we could detect in this particular case the difference between sperm, vaginal epithelia, but not in this, not in this case, um, blood and saliva. So in the current manifestation of our, our system, we've actually developed a multiplex, so we can only, we don't need to do multiple amplifications. We can do a single amplification, and this is the work of So He Cho and Quentin Gaither. Um, this is with the support of a new grant from the National Institute of Justice, and as you can see, we've changed several of the loci to improve discrimination and avoid interferences, such as primer dimers. The multiplex can be analyzed as using pyrosequencing. However, the sample should be split into four wells uh, once amplified, each with a different sequencing primer. The next thing I'll talk a little bit about is uh, the validation studies, and much more extensive work was done by, and I'm sure the group in, from San Francisco will talk about that, but I just want to show some of the results that we had um, in, our, in our work. Uh, this particular slide shows some things we did with the assistance of George Duncan from the Broward Sheriff's Office Crime Lab. And here are some samples that were 20 years old, put on different kinds of substrates. And here you see one for blood and one for sperm. And basically, we can't um, distinguish our results from our published results from these results which are 20 years old. So it shows, as was mentioned earlier, that because these markers are, are covalently bound methylation, uh, they're very stable over time. We also did a whole lot of testing of various non-human samples, and um, as you can see from these results, there were some amplifications of chicken and certain bacteria, but once you use the sequencing primers, then nothing comes up, and only human and certain large primates are able to be detected by this method. So it is human-specific. And even more interestingly, uh, we can be use this procedure to detect mixtures of vaginal epithelia and semen. So here's an, uh, a test uh, in that particular case. We've also looked at blood and, blood and semen and other mixtures. 
And we believe that uh, with our new multiplex, we can do an even more complete job of these kinds of analyses to, to specify the kinds of body fluids that are present. But we're still working on that. Um, another area that we we're interested in is because in the methylation analysis, you move from um, a, a GC base pair to an AT base pair, it ought to be possible to look globally at, at these amplicons uh, by melt curve analysis. As most of you may know, because of the difference in the number of hydrogen bonds between AT and GC base pairs, there should be a difference in the denaturation uh, temperature of the DNA. And that's called melt curve analysis. And what you do is when you're using your real-time PCR, you label it with some kind of intercalating dye. And then as the uh, DNA melts, uh, the temperature at which denaturation occurs is going to be lower with AT-rich sites than GC-rich sites. So therefore, and this is the work of Joanna, uh, and she had a, a special fellowship from the uh, National Institute of Justice, and this was published in Analytical Biochemistry. Um, you can see here uh, the difference between the methylation of semen versus blood and saliva. And while this isn't as specific as the PIRA sequencing method, you can see that it also is possible to use real-time PCR at, uh, if you have the high-resolution melting process for this purpose. Finally, I thought I'd talk a little bit about other aspects once you can do body fluid typing. There's also phenotyping areas that open up in forensics, and this is just beginning to be explored. But already we know that there's um, specific markers for age, and there's a lot of studies being performed on the e effects epigenetically on various kinds of behavior. In particular, things like um, diet, uh, whether you're a smoker, your body mass index, and maybe many other things. And this is because epigenetic effects can also be a response to environment. So we have different areas of epigenetics that we can think about. Um, if we take a look at the next slide, um, I can give you an idea of, of the importance of age determination in forensics. So as many of you know, um, there are a number of research groups beginning to look at the effects of single nucleotide and polymorphisms and using principal component analysis to try to begin to restruct the face, facial features. They also use ancestry information and other things. And so to try to demonstrate this, I took my daughter, Melanie, and I, I went to a website that artificially aged her. And with the only problem that it looks like it gave her a beard or, or at least a, a shadow, um, you get an idea that it's, it's really kind of important to, to determine how people look. And I think the next slide might show that even more critically. Here's this woman, and you can see how her facial appearance is changing over time. And so we begin to work, and, and the, the first uh, student work on this was Deborah Silva, and began to look at the effects of different uh, genetic loci. Uh, here's some of them listed. And normally this kind of work is done with whole genome, uh, you know, methylation array studies. But what we wanted to do is see if there were some specific sites we could locate, which would allow a very simple and easy amplification and get some kind of correlation with age. And this was further uh, um, analyzed in, in our lab by Hussein Alganim. And I'll show you this in the next slide, some of the results that we got. And here it shows that, that with a single amplicon, we can get a difference between predicted and observed age of about 6.9 years or seven years in the case of KLF14 uh, and SCGN. So we looked at a lot of different correlations with these sites, and we can show that we can quickly and easily, in addition to determining body fluid, we can also determine age. The next slide uh, shows the, the, the most recent project we've been working on in our lab. And here is a, uh, one of the first cases where we show a marker for uh, lifestyle. And this is uh, Hussein's work where he's looking at smoking status. And what you see is that in current smokers, uh, where this particular site, which is the AHRR gene, becomes unmethylated because it's assisting with your lungs and uh, clearing uh, the effects of the smoking. Uh, former smokers, the methylation level begins to rise, and never smokers, it's much higher. So again, we have a pattern where if we want to, we have an unknown suspect who, who might not be in a database, we could get some ideas about the age is this person a smoker? And maybe some other things that would uh, help investigative uh, process. So in conclusion, uh, what we've shown is that epigenetic methods can be used to discriminate blood, saliva, semen, and vaginal epithelia. 
The methods fit easily into forensic laboratory workflows. The methods are human specific and show great specificity for samples stored up to 20 years. We can see mixtures and other phenotypic loci such as age, smoking, uh, may also be defined with this technique. Uh, in my last slide, I uh, well, there's I wanted another thing to point out is that that we've had a number of publications and we have more that are coming out, and it's important, of course, for um, to show that peer-reviewed results can be can be shown, and we do that. Our last slide, I just want to talk about the uh, people that worked on this. I've mentioned some of them: Tanya Mahdi, Cooper Reddy, Bala Mergen, Joanna Antunes, Deborah Silva. Clarice Salho, Hussein Algaman, George Duncan, Quentin Gaither, So He Cho, um, and, and assistance from uh, a number of different groups. Of course, my group at Florida International University, University of Southern Mississippi, the Catholic University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil, the Broward Sheriff's Office, and the San Francisco Police Department, and of course, Kyogen, uh, also the Institute of Forensic Science at Seoul National University, and a number of awards from the National Institute of Justice. And, and also from Brazil. Uh, thank you all very much for listening to me, and I'll pass it on uh, to Amy. Thank you, Bruce. Um, also, thank you all for having us here today. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so when Kaijin first um, asked us to um, test prior sequencing um, to ID, ID um, body fluids for forensic purposes, um, one of the things that appealed to us was that um, it utilized DNA extracts that we already had in the lab. So for example, the same DNA extract that we use to amplify um, using SDR kits um, such as Global Filer, and then we can then go ahead and get um, a, a deducible or uh, a male DNA profile um, that could then be, you know, prosecuted in, in um, court. Um, we can also then use that same DNA extract or whatever is remaining to um, test using pyrosequencing. And so once we determine um, what those extracts are that we want to use to test, um, we basically adapted this um, protocol, pyrosequencing protocol that Dr. McCord's lab um, developed um, for our purposes. And so we'll uh, take the remaining DNA extract and then perform the bisulfite conversion on those extracts using the kit, uh, which is an Epitect, um, oh, sorry, let me. these uh, slides. <laughs> I'm like, here you go. Okay, so we're on the right slide. Um, so then we perform the bisulfite conversion on the remaining DNA extracts um, using the Epitech fast bisulfite kit, um, which usually is about um, 15 to 20 microliters. And then we incubate that on a thermocycler for about an hour. Um, and then, then we go ahead and convert uh, that, those samples um, using uh, a Chi-Cube protocol, uh, which takes about an hour, and this can also be done manually, but the Chi-Cube just kind of makes the process a little more easier. Um, and then after that, we amplify um, the purified DNA um, with a Pyromark PCR kit, um, and then um, the tissue-specific PCR primer that we want to use, and that takes about four hours. Um, so, in order to do prior sequencing, we do need an additional um, instrument um, that is not present in the lab, and that is a pyro um, mark Q48 auto prep, and, and that comes with associated software. So to set up um, our samples, um, we have to create a pyro sequencing assay setup file using the auto prep software, and then load that onto the instrument. And then, um, then we load our samples onto the reaction disk, and then place that disk onto the pyro mark. Um, Q48 auto prep for sequencing, and that usually takes about an hour and a half. And then we use the software then to analyze the data um, that uh, has come off the machine. So when we um, first decided to do this, we did some preliminary testing. And um, we're mainly um, interested in the semen primer. Um, there are like four primers, tissue-specific primers, but we're mainly looking at the semen primer because we wanted to use it more for sexual assault cases. and um, so one of the questions that we had was, well, is this primer specific to sperm or seminal fluid? Um, because that determined um, and when we're doing differential extraction, uh, which um, fraction we would be using, the sperm fraction or the epithelial fraction. And, um, and then and another thing that we wanted to look at um, was how to make it more sensitive because um, the pyro sequencing kits were originally developed more for clinical research purposes, which uh, targeted high quantities 
of DNA, usually greater than 100 nanograms. And we don't rarely see that in forensic um, uh, samples. So we wanted to see if we could increase the sensitivity of the PCR amplification. And one way of doing that was by adjusting the ramp rates on the thermocyclers, which basically is um, changing the rate at the that the temperatures um, increase and decrease um, as they cycle through. And, um, and then also we wanted to look at, um, do some basic tests to confirm the concepts um, that uh, were discussed in all these published papers on pyro sequencing, just to you know, see what they look like, such as um, what the percent methylation ranges were um, with, at different, for different samples and different types of samples and different dilutions. So the first thing here, um, these are pyrograms that were produced um, during our testing for um, the confirmation of, of sperm. And so as you can see here, uh, we looked at the first sample was an aspermic uh, semen sample, and, um, and that basically was hi um, highly methylated. So um, it's more indica indicative of epithelial cells. Whereas if you look at the sperm positive sample, um, the sperm fraction, which is you know, where the spermatozoa is isolated, is um, mostly non-methylated at zero to 4%. Um, and the uh, non-fraction, non-sperm fraction of the neat semen sample was kind of a mix um, at about 32 to 38% of what you see with um, epithelial cells and sperm. So that confirmed that sperm was in fact the um, target of the semen primer. So then also we looked at the ramp rates um, during PCR amplification. And so the original um, pyro sequencing protocol had a ramp rate of about six, degree, uh, six degrees Celsius per second. Um, and so we decreased that and slowed that down. Um, and we looked at um, one degree Celsius, two degrees Celsius, and three degrees Celsius and compared, to, compared, compared that to the six degrees. And um, as you can see here, um, at one degree, the difference between one degree and three degrees was already a huge difference. So there's a market improvement um, at the lower um, ramp rate. And so that is the one that we went with. The, unfortunately, the downside of that is that it increased the amplification time from originally, I think it was about an hour and a half to about over four hours. Um, and then next, uh, we also looked at um, how sensitive could the semen primer um, be used. And so by decreasing the ramp rate, we were actually able to get it um, down to pretty sensitive levels. Um, so here we looked at uh, a range at a high of, you know, a high quantity of 50 nanograms of neat semen all the way down to 0.01. And as you can see, um, you know, at 50 nanograms, we had, um, you know, perfect pyrogram um, results. Um, and then down to 0.01, where it basically, we barely anything was detected, and then um, we had some results at 0.05, um, but they were not very, um, you know, very strong results. And so actually, um, we ended up kind of finding the ideal range to be between 0.1 to 0.5 nanograms, and we um, continue to do more replicates in that range. And actually, Peter will um, speak more about that, so I'm going to pass it on to Peter. Thank you, Amy. Um, so after we did these preliminary tests, uh, we wanted to kind of get a baseline on how it compared to the current methods we were using in our lab, which is sperm searching slides. So we went back to data from 2017 when we we're still using the traditional sperm search as a confirmatory method for the presence of sperm. And we wanted to pull data regarding um, total quant, male quant, whether a male DNA profile was detected in the electropherogram, and then also whether that male DNA profile was able to be uh, deduced from the, from the uh, profile. And the main things we wanted to look at were the correlation between the male quant and whether we were observing sperm, and then also how the male to female ratios affect our ability to deduce out a male profile. So we kind of wanted to find some benchmarks. So we compiled data from 432 sperm fractions from female victims. And some quick facts that we found were that 216 of these were sperm positive. Out of those 216 samples, 181 of them showed a male present in the electropherogram. And of those 139, a male profile was able to be deduced. So this first graph 
um, shows the sensitivity based on male quant. So we're looking at whether sperm was observed, whether male, a male was detected, and whether that male was able to be deduced. And some takeaway points from this data compilation exercise was that the visual detection of sperm in a pre-digest slide is more sensitive than a Y screening method, which is to be expected when you're doing a differential extraction. You're, with a low amount of sperm, you may be losing a lot of that sperm during your wash steps. And the other point was around 100 to 200 picograms, we were able to pretty reliably deduce out a male profile. However, once we were getting below 100 picograms, that's when we started to see a steep decline in our ability to reliably deduce out a male profile. And then this next slide looks at our ability uh, to deduce out profiles based on male to female ratio. So on the x-axis, we have um, the different ranges for male to female ratios, and then we're looking at how the total input DNA um, affects our ability to deduce out the male profile. And what we're seeing is that ratios of less than 1 to 10, we're starting to lose the ability to deduce out a male profile. And then also across most mixture um, ratios, once we had less than 100 picograms of total DNA input, male DNA input, we were also losing the ability to reliably deduce out a male profile. So after we kind of got some benchmarks on how to compare this to our traditional screening methods, we needed to look at how other bodily fluids perform using the semen primer, so non-semen samples. And this is important to identify that lower range in our methylation values for those non-semen samples, because when we start dealing with mixtures, which we see in differential um, extraction, samples that are differentially extracted, we're going to start seeing intermediate values for those methylation percentages. So we need to identify that low end of the range on non-semen samples so that we're able to confirm the presence of sperm in a mixture sample. So we used a two-tiered strategy, and this helped us identify the sensitivity limits of our pyrosequencing method. So the first part, we ran a dilution series of a non-semen sample, and we tried to identify the input range when we're starting to see weaker amps, and then also we were seeing methylation values fall outside of our expected ranges. And once we identified uh, that target input, we would run replicates in that range to um, try to see how reproducible those results are. And so what we saw was that all biological material amped with a semen primer amped basically the same. So the, the strength of an amp did not depend on what you were putting into the PCR reaction, which is what we expected. And then also to really get dependable results that you can make um, a confirmatory statement regarding the presence of sperm, we need to know um, that we had a certain level of input DNA into the bisulfite conversion. And then also on our pyrograms, there's quality, data quality flags that um, pertain to how well the PCR reaction uh, worked. And if those flags produce passing quality, we knew that if we had two of those, those two, I guess, requisites being met, then our data was reliable. So around 100 picograms for all of, all of the tissue types, that's when we started seeing weaker amps, more stochastic effects, and methylation values falling outside of the ranges we'd expect. And here is just kind of an example of what we're looking at. So this, both these charts have the same data. They're just highlighted in a different way. On the left, we're looking at the amp quality. So anything highlighted blue shows a strong amp. And on the right side, 
um, the green shows values that are falling within our expected ranges. So we want the blue and the green to kind of overlap, which we see in around 100 picograms is when we're still getting pretty good data, but it's showing to be not as reproducible. And here's an example of the vaginal epithelia. We have the dilution series, and on the left we have the pyrogram quality, and you can see that even down to 50 picograms, we're still getting good data. However, at those levels, that data is not as reproducible as when we have, say, 200 picograms. So then we knew that we have to address the issue of mixtures. So we wanted to see what those intermediate values would look like when we're um, dealing with a mixture. And so we used inputs of one nanogram and 10 nanograms, so that's a lot of DNA. Um, but we just wanted to make sure that uh, the data we were looking at would be accurate as far as the methylation values. And we had ra ratios ranging from 9 to 1 to 1 to 9 semen to vaginal epithelia. And so I just used a cutoff of less than 50% as what we would say is possibly confirmatory for presence of sperm. And th that's pretty conservative. And we can see that down to 1 to 2, we're pretty confident in calling that positive for sperm. And then even in those ratios of 1 to 4, we're seeing methylation values in the 50 to 60 percent range, which is still lower than non-semen body fluid. The methylation values we're seeing in non-semen bodily fluids. So we think that that ratio could be expanded for um, confirmatory purposes. We also ran everything through Global Filer concurrently to, to see if the sensitivity was at least comparable, and what we found was that, you know, at 100 picograms using Global Filer, we're still getting usually full profiles. Sometimes they were high partial profiles, um, and with pyro sequencing at that point, we're still getting good data. Although sometimes um, the AMP quality was low, or we'd see methylation values falling outside of our expected ranges. So this kind of showed us that the sensitivities of Global Filer and this Pyromark kit were at least comparable, which is a good sign if we want to use it in casework. Okay, so kind of going back to the data we mined from our 2017 cases. So we had 216 sperm positive samples. Of those, 139 had a deducible male profile. So if we use the assumptions that if we have 200 picograms of total male input DNA into our pyrosequencing assay, as well as a ratio of male to female DNA of greater than one to two, we're going to say that we can call that um, a confirmatory test. We're going to say that's confirmatory for the presence of sperm. So we know that all those 139 deduced male profiles were sperm positive. So with pyro sequencing, using those assumptions, 63% of those profiles would have been called um, sperm positive. So it's not up to 100%, so there still needs to be work. And I think a lot of that has to do with how we interpret the mixtures. Another thing we looked at was we had 12 samples out of 208 for sperm that had a deducible male profile, but were sperm negative. And with our current methodology, we don't know if that's possibly another bodily fluid, or maybe there is sperm in that sample, but in the little portion that was spotted on a slide, maybe it wasn't identified, or there's a lot of debris on the slide, which can make it difficult to spot um, low sperm counts. These things could be identified using a methylation assay. So this is kind of an aside. Throughout our testing, we saw what we called stochastic effects. Basically, at low levels of DNA input, usually 100 picograms or less, um, we would see strong amps, 
that were flagged as passing quality with the Pyromark software. However, the methylation values fell well outside of the ranges we would expect. And it usually wasn't at all of the CPG sites. It would be at one, two, or three of them. And we were having trouble kind of wrapping our heads around what was going on. And we found an article by um, New et al. And they had run simulations using biological models to predict methylation percentages. And what they found was that as you decrease DNA, you also increase um, your variance, which is not shocking. However, how they explained it kind of gave us an idea of what we were seeing. So methylation is a binary event at each CPG island. So it's either 100% methylated or 0% methylated. It is or it is not methylated. So at low levels, when you're looking at maybe not a non-representative a non portion of cell sample, so 10, 10 cells, if you're taking a couple of cells that have that are methylated and the tissue type you're looking at is generally not methylated you can see a large skew in the methylation values at those low template levels so this was kind of explaining why we'd see um, these ranges outside of what we would expect on the low template DNA all right, so the main takeaways that we had were that this can be used as a confirmatory test for sperm. Um, the results are dependent on your total input DNA as well as the AMP quality. Um, also, we realized that we need a better way of kind of interpreting the mixture samples and understanding the intermediate values. So in order to do that, we need to run more data, do population studies to make sure that the value, those ranges hold true across populations. Um, the multiplex that Bruce is working on, that Dr. McCord is working on, provides greater specificity, which could greatly increase that, those mi mixture ratio ranges that we're able to make conclusive statements about. Then also possibly using a probabilistic um, approach Maybe like a, and maybe not saying yes or no, semen or sperm is present. Maybe using likelihood ratios because we have five CPG sites that each have a methylation percentage. We also have our total input DNA that we know from the male quant. Um, we also have the pyrograms, which have relative light units associated with them. So maybe if we can kind of better utilize all of that data, we can better interpret the results that we get. So I'm going to hand it back to Seth. Um, so thank you all. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Bruce, Amy, and Ruth, for the in-depth presentation. We are now taking questions on today's webinar. Um, we're almost to the hour, so I don't know how many questions we will get in. Um, I would like to encourage everyone to continue submitting questions uh, at any time by typing into the space provided on your screen. Because all questions that are not discussed in this question and answer segment right now uh, will be answered by representatives of Kyogen at a later time. Um, so the first question, um, it goes to Amy and Peter. Um, and just to clarify, are you referring to total input DNA or the amount per microliter, as in, you know, nanograms, uh, picograms? Hi. Um, yeah, so we're actually talking about the total amount of DNA, not, um, nan like not nanograms per microliter. Okay, great. Yep, that does clarify. The second question is for Dr. Claver. How long does the pyro sequencing analysis from you know the PCR product to the analysis result take? Yeah, so the pyro sequencing analysis um, consists of two parts: the template preparation and the sequencing. The template preparation always takes 30 minutes, 
and the sequencing de length depends on the um, length of the sequence. So um, one nucleotide is incorporated per hour, uh, per minute, sorry. <laughs> so if you have a sequence um, around 100 base pairs, you have to calculate 100 minutes for the sequencing. Great, great. And I think this might be the last question. Uh, this final question is for uh, Dr. McCord. Um, how might environmental factors affect results in tissue typing and age determination? Um, I think in the case of the tissue typing, because the processes involved are fundamental to the success of the organism, it's not likely that there's going to be much effect to the environmental. In the case of age, uh, again, we're looking at sites which appear to be stochastically modified over time. And you do see more dispersion in the capability or the accuracy of age determination as, as an individual gets older. Um, so, but it, it's because these, of the way these sites are, are really not being accessed by the body as much, I think it's it's less than uh, you might otherwise expect. Great, great, thanks. And I think that will be it for questions. Um, we're over the hour a little bit. So that does conclude our webinar for today. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, and a special thank you, of course, to our uh, four exceptional speakers, uh, Bruce McCord, Peter St. Andre, Amy Lee, and Ruth Claver and to our sponsor, Kyogen. Um, look out for an email with a link to access this webinar on demand within the next couple of days. And until next time, may you find the answers you're looking for. Kyogen. Sample to Insight.